Yes. Yeah. All right, so you are welcome to the second live stream powered by Elisa Academic Board. And for this session, we are going to be introduced to applied electricity ee 151 we are so delighted to have each and every one of you here present i am kwame vipra from paul ama and i am going to be your tutor for the next hour and for our applied electricity session. And I would want you to be aware that anytime you have any questions, you can type them in the chat space and we will attend to your questions. Anytime you don't understand any concept at all, just let us be aware by notifying us in the chat space. Frank Teria, we are glad you are here first. And we can also see Godfred Osei Bonsu. We are happy to have everyone here. And I think it's 3.30. It's 3.30. Um, as we speak, we have about 24 people watching now and um we would give ourselves about five minutes hoping that more people join us and then we begin um some dot yes shout out to some dot too I see you. We hope you enjoyed the algebra session. And like we did in the first session, if you can also rep your department here, we can just say hi. For example, if I'm doing it, I'll say hi. I'm Pepra from electrical engineering department. And so, we want to ask ourselves, why is applied electricity important? Why are we studying applied electricity? Um, for the electrical engineers here, everything you do would have to do with circuits. But then, generally speaking, since this is a course that is being taken by almost all engineering programs, it implies that we will all need it in our fields in one way or the other. And in our fields, once we realize that everything, the energy, the form of energy in which energy is transferred is electrical energy. And so when we are powering systems with electricity, we need to know certain uh, specifications of materials we we'll need to know probably how um, how much current can pass through a particular material and why we should use that material in a particular branch. And, and to do this, we will need to be able to analyze circuits. And in the analysis of circuits, there are various techniques that we will use. In this course, Applied Electricity, that is EE151, we are going to learn how to analyze simple electrical circuits 
with DC, we are also going to analyze them using AC single phase as well as AC three phase systems. And then we will look at magnetic circuits. And so it applied electricity as we see is an analytical course. A course in which we are going to analyze circuits to be able to determine various things. We'll also want to inform you that as we did for algebra, there's a link to a quiz in the description of this video. And so after we have after we have gone through the introduction to applied electricity, we will entreat each and every one of you to tap that link and then answer the questions in that document so we know how well you understand the concepts. And just to see, I think the feedback from the algebra results show that most of you understood what was taught today and we are really proud of you. Keep the performance up and we know that you guys will do very well. You get good averages and everything. And so we would we will want to move straight to what we are doing. So Okay. So the link for the book we are using will be in the chat session section. The link to this book. Um that is the fundamentals of applied electricity. Fund fundamentals of electrical and magnetic circuits. The link to that, the link to the drive is going to be shared. When you click, you click applied electricity, same one, applied electricity. You go to the PDFs and then you find it. And this is a very good book written by our very own professors in our department. Professor T.Y. Otre, Philippia Otre, and then Professor Emmanuel Esumin Prempong. And so we'll move straight ahead. Like I said, we'll be doing an analysis of circuits. And so it means that we'll need to know what the circuits comprise of or what makes up a circuit. And we'll realize that the, the components of the circuit are what we call elements of the circuit. And in these circuits, we have two main components. And we'll call them the active elements and then the passive elements. So for the active elements, these are elements which supply electrical energy to other components so that the other components consume them. And so these active elements in themselves ideally do not consume any electrical energy. They only produce, they make available energy to be consumed. The most common example is what we know to be batteries or dry cells. They are solar cells, they are generators. And then there are also other electronic devices which supply electrical energy. But then what do they supply this electrical energy as? And that takes us to what we call, they are also called sources. And so we'll have voltage sources and then current sources. So they are supplying electrical energy, but then voltage sources are supplying voltage or they are providing voltage. And current sources are providing or supplying current. 
we would shortly explain what we mean by voltage and then current will also explain what we mean by resistance and other terminology which will be very important in our understanding of the fundamental concept of applied electricity so we will begin let us have an illustration we have a battery or a dry cell in a very simple circuit this is a very simple circuit so this here is a voltage source that is our active element and then we have a resistor which is going to consume that energy it is going to consume energy if there's a, a path for current to flow a closed path so from this we would like to define what an electric circuit is so an electric circuit consists of various components interconnected such that current has a closed path to circulate in and to realize that in this what we have is a battery or a voltage source producing energy connected to a resistor via some conductors or wires and we assume that the wires have zero resistance so in this circuit we need to understand certain concepts we said that the battery which is a voltage source is going to produce a certain voltage which is fixed in this case so for that fixed voltage how much current is going to flow through that circuit and that is determined by the resistance of the circuit so it depends on the number of elements and their the magnitude of their resistances in a dc circuit that is what determines how much current flows through and so voltage is fixed and if we say that voltage is fixed which is uh, what we have voltage is fixed but then we are saying that it is dependent on the resistance value of the circuit or the effective resistance of the circuit and we'll be doing a lot of this because we'll have circuits which have a lot of resistors but the question we want to ask ourselves is when we put all the resistors together looking at how they are connected how much what is the value of their resistance or what is the 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 the, the net effect of all these resistances that is what we call the effective resistance it is the effective resistance of the circuit that determines how much current will actually flow through that circuit and so once we realize this then we realize that there's the need for a certain um constant that is if you consider voltage to be fixed consider voltage to be fixed and resistance varying then we realize that uh we said it, it is dependent directly dependent and because of this direct dependence it means that the larger the resistance value the smaller the current is so we have v equals ir which we all know from shs because we passed physics to become engineers and so v equals ir which we know as ohm's law it means that in a circuit for a particular voltage being produced for example if you have a 12 volt battery and then 
you have two circuits. In circuit A, the effective resistance is 6 ohm. And in circuit B, the effective resistance is 3 ohm. We will expect different currents to flow through them. Or we would expect charges to flow through them at different rates. There will be a smaller current in the 6 ohm resistor. Because resistance is the opposition to the flow of current. And so we have opposition to flow of current. A higher opposition. It means that less current will flow through it. Though both circuits have Car, uh, voltage sources producing 12 volts and so they are both produ producing 12 volts but then different currents will flow because of the difference in the values of the effective resistances and so we will now look at other concepts like electric charge current and then voltage we are still explaining these concepts the electric charge, as we read, is a physical property of matter which causes it to experience a force when near other electrically charged matter. And so if we have a, a, a body here, A, body A, and another body B, if A is charged and B is charged, and they are brought close close to themselves, realize that because they have light charges, body A will be pushing body B away. And body B will also be pushing body A away. And so we have the forces going this way and then that way. So because they are both charged, there's a force between them. If they have the same charge, they repel themselves. And if they have different charges, they are attracted. Now, in a closed path, where, where these charges can move, we ask ourselves, how quickly are the charges moving through a certain section within a period of time? And that is the concept of current. That if we have um, X Coulomb of charges passing within a certain speculated time, say Y seconds, then we can have Z amperes. And so the concept of current is simply how quickly current Sorry, how quickly charge is flowing through a particular section of your connection in a particular time. And so we want to ask ourselves that what determines this? Or how do we know how quickly current will be flowing through the circuit in a particular time? If we have a source which is constant, it is producing a constant voltage. And this, like we said, is dependent on what we call the resistance. The opposition the charges face. So resistance is basically the opposition the charges face. If it faces a large opposition, then very little charge flows through within a particular period of time. And that, that means that we'll have a less, uh, the, our rates will be smaller. And that rate is what we call our current. We realize that for a larger resistance, I think you may have seen this illustration where you are trying to push something through this small hole. And then this thing you are trying to push is what they are calling current. And then there's a rope here which is actually holding it, making it tight. And that is the resistance. And then someone, uh, let's say this is 
par rapport à quoi ça? Poussin, whatever is in there, and par rapport à quoi ça is what we call our vote it. So yes, voltage is what is the force that pushes current through the circuit. So voltage, like we realize, when we come, when we go down, when we go ahead, we realize that we say that voltage that is given by sources are called EMFs or electromotive force. Because it is a force pushing current through the circuit. But then the resistance is making sure that the current, or not all the current flows. And then we need to understand that if we have a voltage without a resistance, no current will flow through the circuit. We need a resistance to ensure that current flows through the circuit. And so, moving on. We've spoken about voltage sources. That is sources that produce voltages. And like I said, because they are called, they are active elements, they are not supposed to consume any electrical energy. But I remember I said that is ideal. That is the ideal case. And so in an ideal case, we'll say that a voltage source should have zero resistance. That a voltage source Voltage source should have zero resistance. Love zero resistance. But in actuality, we find that they have a certain small internal resistance. So it does not act as a perfect active element or a perfect source. And so there's that bit of consumption there. But we still call it an active element because largely it produces. What it consumes is very little. Now, there are two kinds of voltage sources. The independent, which do not depend on anything. And then we have the dependent. For example, we may have a certain circuit with this resistor here and having a voltage source here. Right? You can see that this voltage here is equal to a certain constant K times IA, where IA is the current flowing through this branch. So in this case, the voltage produced by this particular source is going to change if the current in this branch changes. And that is what we call a voltage dependent source. So the voltage can be dependent on the current in another branch or the voltage in another branch. But then we wouldn't go so much into this. For current sources, like the name suggests, they produce currents. And so, okay, so in this, we can see that we have a small resistance attached to the voltage source, which is what we call the internal resistance, right? So it reduces the overall voltage being supplied. Now we have current sources. Current sources produce current. And I, I need to mention also that for voltage sources, like we mentioned earlier, the, the current that flows through a voltage source is determined by the overall resistance of the circuit. In like manner, you cannot determine the voltage across a current source just by looking at it or doing some calculations. But then it is determined by the circuits you have. A current source produces current. And so the branch in which you have a current source will have a constant current. And that is what you want us to understand. Like in just, just like the voltage sources, for current sources, 
we have independent as well as dependent current sources all right and so we would move on think passive elements are those elements that consume the energy because you are doing the introduction in all our circuits all we'll see are sources and their resistors because you are dealing with the direct current in our introduction so you realize that resistors are elements which present opposition to current flow in circuits and the value of a resistor is called its resistance and the resistance shows how much it opposes the flow of current in a circuit and the resistance of a material is determined by the material itself and then how long of the material you have and how wide it is so you see the formula there the formula there sorry we would look at series connection and then parallel connection in a circuit before that i will explain a few concepts or some parts of the circuit so we know how to go about that so i'm drawing a circuit i'll show us various parts of the circuit So oh, that is a battery. And this is also another battery. So this right here, which is, okay, let's start this way. We have from this side, moving, like please follow the direction of the pointer to this side is what we call a branch this is one branch this right here is another branch please follow my pointer and this here is also another branch so in this circuit we have three branches one two and three now where two or more branches meet like in this case is what we call a node a node is the intersection of two or more branches And a particular branch can have as many elements as it can. But then when you have two branches intersecting, then you have a node. Realize that in this circuit, we have one node and then another node. So in this circuit, we have two nodes. When you have two resistors, you are considering resistors in series. And so I'm going to use resistors. When you have two resistors in series, what it means is that those resistors are in the same branch. And so if I'm labeling these resistors R1, R2, and R3, then I can say R1 and R2 are in the same branch. R, let me, R1 and R3 are not in the same branch because when i go through this branch i can't find r3 but r3 is in a different branch r2 is also not in the same branch as r3 when we want to know if resistors are in series then we must just check to see if they are in the same branch so if i have another resistor here r four then we can say that r1 and r4 are in the same branch hence they are in series you can also say r2 and r4 are series connected 
because they are in the same branch. You can also say R1, R2, and R4 are in series because they are in the same branch. Even though we can find another element here between R4 and R1 and R2, they are in series because they are in the same branch. So when you have a different element, like a voltage source, let's say a battery, between two resistors, but then they find themselves in the same branch, they are in series. And because they are in the same branch, the same current flows through them. For any particular branch, only one current flows through that branch at a time. And so it means that in this circuit, if we have I here, let's say I1, and we label this I2, what we are saying is that I1 equals I2 because they are in the same branch and so they are in series. That is what we mean when we say resistors are in series. And so what we can also say is that when there is no visible node between any two or more resistors, then those resistors are in series. They are in series or they are series connected. We will now want to know that if we have a certain number of resistors in series, say um, someone has sent a question. Unfortunately, not, not in the chat, but I sent a question saying, hello. Is the current source always the same as the voltage source? Um, current source and voltage sources are different. Like I explained in voltage sources, the current through a voltage source is determined by the effective resistance of the circuit in which the voltage source is placed. It means that different currents can flow through the voltage source depending on the effective resistance of the circuit. But for the current source, only one current can flow through the current source. That is the determined current or the rated current of that current source. And so for a current source, if it is producing 6 amps, where any branch you place it in, it is only 6 amps that will flow through that branch. But for a voltage source, like we explained, if you have 12 volts, if the effective resistance of the circuit is, if you have, in this case, yes, if you have 12 volts, 12 volts, if the effective resistance is 6 ohm, then realize that the current through it is 2 amps. But then if the effective resistance is 3 ohm, then the current through it is 4 amps. We have two different current values under two different conditions for the same value of the voltage source. But when it comes to the current source, whether the effective resistance of the the effective resistance of the circuit is six ohm or three ohm, and then the rated current for the current source is six amps, six amps will flow through regardless of the effective resistance of the circuits. Um, I hope I hope that is clear. Um, Joshua, what am I saying? I'm saying that for a voltage source, for a voltage source, a current flows through it, but then that current is not fixed. It is dependent on the circuit the voltage source finds itself in. And so, let me draw two circuits. So, in this circuit, we have a 12 volt battery with a 6 ohm resistor. Over here, we have a, oh, sorry, let me put the resistor here. We have a 12 volts battery and then a 3 ohm 
resistor. In this circuit, if we have I1, and in this circuit, we have I2, I1 will be equal to 2 ohm, 2 amps from Ohm's law, right? And then I2 will be equal to 4 amps from Ohm's law. Different currents, different conditions. Now let us go to a current source. We have a current source. We have resistor 1, resistor 2. This is 2 ohm, and then this is 2 ohm. This is 6 amps. And then we have another circuit. We have three ohm and then six ohm and then six amp. What we are saying is that I one here, then I one here. I2, sorry. I2 is 6 amp. And then I1 equals 6 amp. Regardless of the resistance values in that circuit. And so for current sources, it has a specified current flowing through that branch. But then different currents can flow through the same voltage source when it has different effective resistances. I hope this is clear enough. Back to what we're saying in series. So now we've explained this concept where resistors are in series. And so for the circuits we see on our left, we can see that R1 and R2 are in the same branch. We can also see that R3 and R4 are in the same branch, and then R5 and R6 are in the same branch. That means that R1 and R2 are in series. R3 and R4 are in series, and then R5 and R6 are in series but we cannot say that r1 and r2 are in series with r3 and r4 because they are not in the same branch we can also not say that r5 and r6 are in series with r2 and r1 because they are not in the same branch i think this should be very understandable now we want to know how do we find the effective resistance of a number of resistors in series? We have Rx. Sorry, for a certain X resistors. For a certain X resistors. For a certain X resistors in series. We say that R. C, which is the total resistance or the effective resistance, is equal to R1 plus R2 plus R3 all the way to Rx minus 1 plus Rx. So you just sum all the resistors you have in a particular branch. Just the algebraic sums. When you sum them, you have the effective resistance of resistors in series. Very simple. And if you understand this, um, you are on your way to making 90 in applied electricity. <laughs> yes. It's not difficult to make the 90 if you understand these very basic concepts. So in this circuit, 
if you have to find the total resistance, all we need to do is to say that RT equals 2 plus 3 plus 1, which is equal to 6 ohm. What this means is that we can redraw this circuit and say that this circuit can be represented by a simpler circuit. And this would be that simpler circuit. Have a voltage source with just one resistor whose value is 6 ohm. And this circuit here is the same as this circuit here. All we've done is to simplify the circuit to represent the entire resistance, all the resistors with just one resistor, whose value is the same as the effective of all the three resistors. And so resistors in series, finding the effective resistors is very easy. Now we come to another arrangement, which is the parallel arrangement of resistors in a circuit. For this, it seems a bit difficult, but it's very easy if you pay attention. For resistance in parallel, I, I like resistance in parallel. I don't know why. But it's nice seeing resistance in parallel, and I hope it will be nice for you too. In parallel arrangements, we are told that the voltage across two resistors, when two resistors are connected in parallel, then the voltage across them is the same. But when I see a circuit, how would I even know that the voltage across them is the same? Hence, knowing that they are in parallel. That is where a very primitive uh, method comes in. And so, we will now tell you to trace a certain path. Remember that when we were dealing with resistors in series, we said that they must be in the same branch. For two resistors to be in parallel, notice that I'm saying two. In series, I said any number of resistors in the same branch. But in parallel, we consider two resistors at a time. When we say two resistors are in parallel, then the two resistors must be in different branches. If they must be in different branches, then it means that there must be at least one node between these two resistors. I'm sure the token is becoming so much. We we'll would do an illustration. I'll redraw the circuit we have here, and then we would consider a few things. Yes, we can see a lot of resistors. We will identify if any of them are in series because we've done the series connection, right? And then we will show ourselves which ones are parallel connected. All right. So let us label our nodes, node one node 2, node 3, node 4, node 5, node 6. So that they must be in different branches. So this is R1, R2, R3, R4, and then R5. Now, I said the two resistors must be in different branches, but that is not the only condition. It is a necessary condition, but it is not sufficient. For two resistors to be in parallel, they must be in different branches. But it doesn't mean that every two, any two resistors you see in different branches are in parallel. For example, R5 and then R1 are in different branches, but we can't say they are in parallel. 
R2 and R5 and R4 are in different branches, but we can't say they are in parallel or they are parallel connected. So what is the other condition? The other condition is that if we trace a path from one of the resistors to another, we should not pass through any other elements. And so over here, let's trace that path. Realize that we've gone to R4. Let's come back to R5. Realize that we come back to R5 and we pass through just R4 and R5. So it means R4 and R5 are parallel connected. R4 and R5 are parallel connected. Now let us consider that for R3 and R2, are R3 and R2 in parallel? Now let us go through them. Let's see. Realize that R3 going through R2. When we come, we come and meet R4. But we are not supposed to meet any other element. So it means that R3 and R4, R2, sorry, and R4 are not in parallel. Or they aren't parallel connected. I hope this is understandable. So, Ephraim has a question. Is dependent voltage source the same as practical voltage source? And why does a practical voltage source have a series internal resistance? Okay. So, a dependent voltage source is a voltage source which produces its voltage based on a parameter value in a different branch. So, going back to this, in this circuit, we are saying that the voltage that will be produced here is dependent on the current value here. So, we will need to calculate for the voltage here, right? But a practical voltage source can be dependent or independent. The practical voltage source simply means that, for example, even here, we can say that this has an internal resistance here. And that will make it a practical voltage source. What the internal resistance does is that it reduces the voltage being produced by the source by a very small amount. And so whether it is dependent or independent, there's a small reduction if it is practical. And it is there because the voltage source is made of components which have resistances. Every, every material has a resistance. So theoretically, we say zero resistance, but then the material actually has a resistance. And so that resistance will be the internal resistance. That will be the internal resistance. But then if we say dependent, all we mean is that the voltage being produced. So for example, it means that at a, a certain time, this can be producing 10 volts. And then at another time, it can be producing what? 6 volts. But then in an independent one, like this one, if it is producing 6 volts, it will always produce 6 volts. I hope there's understanding there now. So we'll now look at how to find the total, the effective resistance, sorry, of resistors in parallel. Now notice what I said, that we consider two resistors in parallel. So for the effective resistance of two resistors in parallel, is the product of the resistances, the product of the resistances divided by the sum of the resistances in parallel. 
But if you have many resistor, many resistors in parallel and resistors in parallel, then you are going to have the inverse of the effective resistance being the inverse of the sum of the sum of the inverse of each resistor. Oh, I think I can bring that here. The inverse of the effective resistance of n resistors in parallel is the sum of the inverse of the individual resistors, which I am doing here. The sum, take note, the sum of the individual inverses. That is what we are talking about. Please don't get confused. If you have any questions, send it to the chat, okay? Because it is the chat we are looking at. If you send it through other means, it's difficult for us to track those ones. And so we will consider an example here. Over here, fortunately, we have okay. Let us let us go step by step in solving this, and then we see how we go about such a problem. So, in looking at this, we immediately realize that the two ohm resistor, because we can trace through two ohm and then three ohm without passing through any other element, and there is at least a node between them. Then we can say that the 2 ohm resistor and the 3 ohm resistor are in parallel. We can say 2, when we want to note that they are in parallel, we do something like this 2 parallel 3, which is equal to 2 by 3 on 2 plus 3, which is equal to 6 on 5. So we can represent those two resistors with one resistor whose value is 6 over 5 ohm. So we can redraw this circuit. So we see that we now have a 1 ohm resistor and our resistors in parallel which have now been represented by just one resistor. So this is 6 over 5 ohm and then this is 1, 1 ohm. So now our effective resistance is what? 1 plus 6 over 5 which is equal to what? 2.2 or 11 over 5. So we can redraw the circuits that we have in example 3 to our left as this voltage source in series with a certain resistance with a value of 2.2 ohm. Don't forget to add your units to your answers. So, when we find the effective resistance, what we are saying is that all the resistors, we can take all of them out and just put a 2.2 ohm resistor there. And it's the same circuit. It, it can tell us to know, it can make us understand how much current is flowing through it. But then you ask yourself, why then should we have a very complex circuit if we can reduce it? We need complex circuits like this so that we can have specified currents flowing through certain parts when we need those currents. Uh -huh. I think this concept is understood. Please solve a lot of examples. Please solve a lot of examples. There are a lot of examples in the book. We will tackle this section later. Series resistors which are not in series, neither are they in parallel. And then move to short circuits and open circuits. Because that is what we promised to tackle in today's session. And I think we are on track and we have a few minutes more. Let's make use of the time left. So I'm reminding you once again that there's a quiz in the description 
the link will be opened only after this tutorial session so don't try tapping on the link now we want you to understand what is going on after which you can now access the quiz to test your understanding of the concepts discussed here so we'll now look at the concepts of short circuit and then open circuit but before that i think someone has a question yes. Please, why can't it be the 1 ohm in parallel with the 2 ohm and the results being in series with the 3 ohm? Okay, um, the name is Abba, right? Abba. Okay, let me redraw the circuit here and then we'll now do some tracing. So we see why we didn't consider that in series or in parallel, right? all right so three two one let's go so one ohm and then two ohm remember we said that there should be at least a node between them so first condition is satisfied second condition when we trace from one ohm through two ohm back to one ohm there should be no element in the way. Let us do that. We realize that we meet an element here, which is a voltage source. And so it doesn't satisfy that condition. We can't say one ohm is in parallel with two ohms. And if you did that, and magically, you made them to be in parallel, what you are going to do is that you are going to have a circuit in which there was no active elements but only passive elements because you would have eliminated this and when you eliminate this what it means is that nothing is producing electricity nothing can consume no current can flow in the circuit so you need to be very careful when you are considering which element is in parallel with what it shouldn't pass through another component so um araba i hope sorry abba abba i hope you understand now so you're asking why we didn't tackle delta star transformations we want to give you an introduction to applied electricity they're very simple things Delta and star is simple. I'm sure you studied it, and that's why you're asking why we didn't tackle. Okay. Um, you can contact us. We'll give you a few tips on that. But we will treat that. This is a one-hour session, and we can only do as much. We cannot treat everything in this one-hour session. So we picked specific things we wanted to tackle. Not that it's not important. It's very important. Very important. All right. So for the short circuit. Of, uh, we will not be able to tackle our voltage drop and then current division because of time constraints. So we'll end at short circuit and an open circuit. But if we should have tackled current division or... All right, Abba, it's great to understand. If, like I mentioned earlier, the current through a particular branch depends on the resistance in that branch. So it means that if we have a certain circuit here with resistor here and then another resistor here, let's say this is 3 ohm, then this is 2 ohm. We have a certain I here, and then I1 and i2 because there's a higher opposition in this branch the 3 ohm branch we are saying that the current in i2 should be greater than the current in i1 
And I hope we'll be able to understand this, judging that the path of least resistance is preferred by current. So more current flows through the path which gives it the least resistance. If this is true, then if we should have an extension of this, If we should have an extension of this right here, there's another branch. When current gets to this junction, it sees this branch. It sees this branch, and then it sees this branch. In this branch, there's an opposition of two. In this branch, there's an opposition of three. In this branch, there's zero opposition. Which path should current take? Should it split into dividing the zero itself between the part of zero resistance, part of two resistance, and then part of three ohm resistance? Current, when it sees a part of zero resistance, would direct all the currents through that path. And so if you have this and we have I3 here, I3 here, we will realize that this equation will now be very untrue. And then we will have I3 being greater than I2 and I1. And then I2 will be equal to I1, which will be equal to 0 amp. Because when current sees a path of 0 resistance, current would flow through that path. All the currents at that junction will flow through that path. There will be no division. And in that case, we'll say that the resistors which have no currents flowing through them, in this case, the 2 ohm resistor and the 3 ohm resistor have been short-circuited. They have been short-circuited. So in the diagram we see to our left in the book, we see that when current gets to the node labeled B, when current gets to the node labeled B, we are going to have, when current gets to this node, the current is now supposed to determine if it is going to now use this path. Let's do some tracing. It's going to use this path. Or it's going to use this path. It continues this way. Or it is going to use this path. Now I realize that path BC through CD has some resistance. Path BCF has some resistance. But path B G has zero resistance. And so all the currents produced here will now flow through this and then come back here. It will come this way, go that way here. Because there's zero resistance here. So all the currents that is at this junction will pass through this. In this case, we say that R1, R2, and R3 have been short-circuited. And I hope you understand this concept. Hope you understand the concept. So, I think this is, this is the diagram I think I drew earlier. A very similar diagram. So we realize that when current flows through this resistor and gets to this point, there's a resistance here. When we take this part, there's a resistance here. But when we take this part, there's no resistance. And so all the current will flow through here. And then zero current will flow through R2 and R3. And then we can see that R2 and R3 have been short-circuited. Please do well to solve a lot of examples. So a short circuit is a branch of 
if you have a branch of theoretically zero resistance, then that branch is a short circuit. And although we call that branch a short circuit, what we say is that what we say is that that branch, if you have that branch of zero resistance, that branch is a short circuit. A short circuit. But then the short circuit has short circuited various resistances. Uh, one ohm and two ohm have a component between them. But why are they considered parallel? I think it's in reference to the other question, right? All right, let's quickly go back for Joshua's sake. Oh, one ohm and two ohm. We didn't say they are parallel. We said two ohm is in parallel with three ohm. Someone was asking why we didn't consider one ohm to be in parallel with two ohm. And we were saying that one ohm and two ohm are not in parallel because we meet a voltage source. So if that, if probably, if I said otherwise, then pardon me. But then indeed, one ohm and two ohm resistors are not in parallel. You are very right on that one. So our last concept to be considered, and then we can call it a day today. That is the concept of open circuits. We said in short circuits, it is a branch of theoretically zero resistance. But for the open circuit, it is a branch of theoretically infinite resistance. Remember that we said that the greater the resistance value, the smaller the current that passes through that branch. But now we are having a resistance that is so high that no current can pass through that branch. Then that branch is an open circuit. Open circuit in the sense that no current can flow through that branch. So in this branch, for instance, it's an open circuit because this, this R2 plus R3 is so high, is so high that R2 plus R3 is approximately equal to a certain very large number, infinity, such that no current can pass through that. And so we say that R, the branch in which R2 and R3 are is an open circuit. No current passes through that part. And so when we consider the circuit to our left, following the cursor, see the current comes through this side, it comes this way, and then uses this part back to this. So because of this opening circuit, R4 and R5 are disconnected from the circuit, such that no current passes through those, even though those are not open circuits. And so that is the end of today's session if you have any questions please okay i think i have a little time and so i'll treat voltage drop so that you can solve the questions we've placed there remember i said active elements produce energy while passive elements consume them Everything produced by the active element must be consumed by a component in the circuit. So, it means that, it means that, what this means is that when you have X volts, um, let me draw this here. When you have A resistor here, a resistor here, then what we are saying is that 
if you have x volts being produced here a certain y volt will be consumed here and the remainder should be consumed by this so x minus y volts will be consumed by this and that's a simple one by voltage drop a voltage is produced by a source and it is consumed by elements in there and so when this resistor consumes it the voltage that was produced by this is reduced by a certain amount the amount by which it is reduced is what is called a voltage drop across this component and so i think that is enough for you to think about and then try answering the questions in the link which will be accepting responses very soon for now if you have any questions you can ask them in the chat area and this will continue monday hopefully both in the morning and in the late afternoon as today and so we will we will have the same sessions and we'll have questions for you to answer so please access the questions if you have any challenges if you think you need to rewatch the videos do rewatch them and then solve the questions again that is why we allow for multiple responses so you can solve them watch the videos if you think you do not understand something in that way until you really understand what is going on if you have any questions you can contact any elisa executive we will direct you to members of the elisa academic board who will provide you with the help also and this announcement goes to the electrical engineering students in elite uh, in kenyst if you haven't filled that elisa form please do fill it since mentorship for, uh, list will be released soon so that you can also get help from senior course mates when you have such challenges i'll be attending to a few questions and then you go ahead joshua mother's question is on the recent diagram why do we say current cannot reach the 5 ohm and then the 4 ohm resistance when there is a path there i'm sure it was on short circuit um recent that short circuit wow 4 ohm and 5 ohm um, I'm not seeing what Joshua is talking about. Um, Joshua, could you could you could you send us an email describing that one? We will tackle it in the next stream. Since I'm finding it difficult to find the circuit you are speaking of, and so if there are no more questions then we will end this stream and we wish you well we will share the link of the recording with you so that those who couldn't join us live will do so and then those who want to re-watch to understand the concepts better can also do so but don't forget the link to the questions is being the link to the question has been opened now. And so you can access the questions, solve them, provide your answers, and then you get feedback as soon as you are done. Thank you very much for joining us. And like I said, I'm Prepara from Pong Ama, third year electrical engineering student. And I was your tutor for today. <laughs>